Alrighty, well, welcome back everybody to Ultrasound Grand Rounds again this week. Pretty excited to be back. We took a little bit of a break last week for spring break. My family and I were traveling uh, all over the country, or at least over a per certain portion of the country, and we were doing a whole bunch of fun things, seeing the sights, not really doing ultrasound, but we're back. We're hitting it again this week. Uh, pretty excited. We have a guest speaker in the studio with me today. So today we're going to talk a little bit about gastric ultrasound. This is something that was originally introduced to me by my anesthesia colleagues. Uh, we don't do a ton of it in the emergency department, mostly probably just because we don't know a lot about it, but this is something that anesthesia folks do a lot. And so I am really excited to have one of our anesthesiologists here talking to us today. So we have on the line, Dr. Mike Leeds, who's one of our attending anesthesiologists and also one of our senior residents, um, a Dr. Dan Schwartz, who's one of our fourth year residents. He's interested in doing some anesthesia critical care next year. And um, Dr. Leeds said he had a spectacular lecture on gastric ultrasound. So I'm really excited to hear this, to learn some stuff, and maybe find some little elements that I can incorporate into my practice down in the emergency department. All right. <clears throat> thank you very much for having me, uh, Dr. Tabit, and the rest of the department. Just want to say thank you, and doc thank you for Dr. Leach for kind of overseeing a lot of my research. Um, so today what we're going to talk about, just kind of a brief overview of gastric point-of-care ultrasound. Um, the aim of today is I'm going to try and present you guys basically a new tool in your ultrasound imaging toolkit because I know you guys do a lot of point-of-care ultrasound down in the ED. Um, so hopefully giving you guys a new tool and that you will kind of know how to interpret and then be able to implement kind of at your own discretion. Um, I just want to, I guess, apologize here. I am coming kind of from that anesthesia world. So that's kind of where a lot of the slides and where a lot of the original um, content came, to, came from. Um, but I will try to, my best to gear it towards the emergency medicine world. And then at the end, obviously, we'll have time for uh, lots of questions here. Um, so without any further ado, we're going to talk about gastric point of care ultrasound and see if it's a new standard of care or maybe just some more hocus pocus here. So quick, um, no dis, uh, financial interests or any conf uh, conflicts of interest to, um, to disclose. I'm a resident here and I get nothing extra for this. So like I mentioned, um, basically just gonna kind of talk about gastric ultrasound as a new tool for you guys. And I think in general, one way to talk about point of care ultrasound is through this IAIM method. Um, that's kind of a lot of the ways that You'll see this in the literature, and it's just an acronym, I, indications, A, acquisitions, the I, again, interpretation, and then your medical decision making. Basically, when do we use the tool? How do we get the tool? How do we use it? And then what are we using based off of the information that this tool gives us? Or just other ways to think about it, why, when, how, and then what do we do from there? <laughs> So gastric pocus at a glance, um, it's an emerging point of care tool. A lot of the research here is more grounded in the theory and a lot of the validations are still coming out. Um, so it's almost kind of like a nice wild west with regards to point of care ultrasound and gastric in particular, but it seems to be a really nice emerging point of care tool, allows for rapid bedside assessment of stomach contents. It's both qualitative and quantitative as we're gonna get into a bit. Um, it's easy to learn, so about 33 scans at the minimum. One study showed you can get about 90% accuracy rate. One thing to note, though, is that it's pretty binary with regards to how it stratifies um, gastric contents. Either the stomach will be relatively full, will be either full or empty, and therefore will get either a low or a high aspiration risk. One thing also to note is I didn't really see anything with regards to any percentages or any risk with like numbers of, you know, low risk aspiration corresponds to this, high risk of aspiration corresponds to that increased chance. Um, but why are we looking at gastric point of care ultrasound? What is this tool usually for? Um, so in the anesthesia world, one big thing that we are looking for is to minimize, minimize any chance of pulmonary aspiration. This is a relatively uncommon event in the um, operating room, about one to 2,000 or 3,000 general anesthetics. But when it does happen, it is a very associated with very high morbidity and mortality rate um, to the point where about half of anesthesia-related mortality is airway-related. Um, one thing to note that if you guys do have an aspiration event, there's about three of the most well-established factors of your morbidity in a gastric, in a aspiration event. Firstly, are you aspirating solid particulate matter? Are you aspirating a volume greater than 0.8 cc's per kilogram? And are you aspirating contents that are very acidic with a pH less than 2.5? 
So why do we care about this? Where's gastric point of care ultrasound? Where's it kind of fit into this um, kind of world of what we do with po- uh, point of care ultrasound? So this first study I want to direct you to, this first table here, came out of a study in um, New Delhi in India. So an emergency part- emergency department, they took a 100 um, um, urgent or emergent intubations right there in the emergency department, and they did gastric point of care ultrasound on all of them. Um, And one thing that I want to point out is that of these 100 people, eight had gross, obvious macro aspirations. Um, And then you would imagine that would maybe even be more depending on if you have micro aspirations. But I just gave you that number of, you know, it's relatively uncommon in the OR world, but it seems that in the uh, emergency room with uh, everything that you guys deal with, it's a much higher, um, much more highly prevalent problem that you guys see here. But then what this study then was also able to do is that if you see here in this kind of red highlighted um, box down here, that they were able to show that a cutoff, basically if you have a your gastric volume, if it's greater than this cutoff here, that served as a benchmark that was basically a hundred percent sensitive for um for being for for being a predictor of aspiration and a 92 percent specificity rate with regards to aspiration events um and this can be pretty i think well discerned here in the second table down here so what they did was they took 40 patients that they knew were um that they knew were full, and then they took 40 patients that they knew were empty and basically had a few blind um, clinicians just ultrasound them. And in the full stomach group, the ones that were actually full stomach, they were able to catch them being full stomachs 40 out of 40 percent, 40 out of 40, so literally 100 percent success rate. And then in the negative group, um, there was only one false positive, but no false negative. So again, we're getting that 100% sensitivity with a very high specificity. One thing to note with this second group is, or the second um, study here in table two, or that third table, is that these were clinicians that had had over 100 studies under their belt. So again, it's a tool, and like any other tool, it really has to be <clears throat> honed. Um, but when that is a well-learned and established and honed tool, it really does give you very accurate information. And then there's this third study here that I don't think applies too much for you guys in the emergency medicine world, so I'm just going to kind of blow through it. But basically in 912 um, fasted patients, that 32 were still full stomach, so about 6.5% of your patients, even if they say they are full stomachs, that they have been NPO greater than eight hours, they just by chance will be actually still full stomach. So even in patients with high probabilities that you're suspecting that are negative stomach, if you have the time, you can um, you can consider putting probes on these people as well. So I kind of touched on it, but just your indications, when do you use this uh, gastric point of care ultrasound? Um, so like I said, in the anesthesia world, we use it pre-anesthetic aspiration risk assessment tool. But for you guys, it's basically anytime you're uncertain about their perennial status, anytime you have any suspicion that they're full stomachs um, or you're just really uncertain about what their gastric status is. For example, um, these are patients that have severe cognitive dysfunction, severely demented, language barriers, you can't get a hold of a translator. Um, you know, an image is worth a thousand words in that in that case. Um, or if you have medical conditions that increased your suspicion of gastric emptying, uh, for example, people with diabetic gastroparesis, anyone on Ozempic or any other GLP-1 agonist therapy, these are very um, kind of in vogue medications for weight loss and are really popping up a lot more than we used to see them. People on chronic opioids, severe critical illness, severe renal, liver dysfunction, um, severe traumas, these are all situations in which we know that we have impaired gastric emptying, but now with gastric ultrasound, we're able to really see and assess kind of the um, the set individual status of these individual patients. So how do you actually get your image? So it's actually a relatively, I think, simple study. It's 
kind of uh, epigastric sub right under the xiphoid. Um, you just kind of start there and you can sweep and rotate to kind of find your antrum at the level of the aorta. Now, the important part there is at the level of the aorta. So you use your liver as a window and that'll shoot into the um, to the antrum. But as you can imagine, the stomach runs, the antrum runs laterally. It starts a little bit on the left and can run right in the, into the pylorus and the duodenum. So that finding at the level eight, level of the aorta is kind of crucial because that shows you the most dependent um, site where the fluid is most likely to collect there. So if you don't find it at that level of the aorta, you are um, liable to maybe get a false negative there because that fluid's not actually collecting where you're viewing it. If you're not able, um, other maneuvers you can do to kind of clarify your image, you can kind of heel and toe to uh, optimize your acoustic reflection. Really try and avoid, try and really catch the antrum cross-sectionally as best as you can. Um, and then one thing to note is that this has to be done ideally in two positions. So you start supine, but then you have to put them in the right lateral decubitus position because that will make, again, that gravity just kind of pull everything down into where you have your probe. If for whatever reason um, patients or the uh, situation doesn't allow for right lateral, right lateral decubitus, you can place these people, just drop the head of the bed a little bit and have them in the uh, semi-recumbent position. It's a suitable alternative um, to right lateral decubitus, but not as ideal. But if you can't get right lateral, then definitely try and get your semi-recumbent uh, view as well. So basically a lot of gastric point of care ultrasound is a lot of ultrasound in general. It's really just applied anatomy. So we're just going to kind of just go over the anatomy and then just kind of talk about what you're going to see on your ultrasound. So as I mentioned here in this top left, the gas, the stomach itself is composed of a few parts. So coming down from the esophagus goes into the cardia, your esophageal sphincter is here, um, into the main portion of the stomach, which is the body, and then you have your fundus on superior aspect. And then it, the stomach is basically a, a funnel, and then that funnels down into the antrum. And this is where we are catching our stomach at a cross section, because that's basically the best, as you can see now, that's the most uh, sensitive area to see it. Everything collects down from the cardia and just kind of pools into the antrum. And then when you put these people in the right lateral decubitus, that everything falls even more, make it even more specific. So one thing to note here is, as you can see, kind of when it's overlied with the aorta, you can give it, it, you can see now how that gives you your spatial orientation with regards to left and right or laterality, um, your liver and your SMA will give, or your pancreas can kind of give you superior and inferior information, but that trying to capture the aorta will show you that you're in that right lateral uh, or sagittal plane. Um, and then here on the right, just kind of a CT version of what you're going to see. So the A, the antrum, that's our point of interest. Um, but then, like I mentioned, it's important to have a few landmarks to know that we are catching the antrum where we want it. So I mentioned the liver is going to kind of come up and over and serve as your, um, your, your acoustic window here. Your pancreas is going to be posterior, and then your aorta is going to roll, run um, all the way posteriorly, longitudinally to your image here. And that will tell you that you're on the right plane um, kind of from a laterality perspective. And just one thing to note, try and make sure that you're seeing the aorta and not tripping up with the IVC, like, um, for example, like for an IVC view uh, for subcostal. One thing to note also is that you can see there's the stomach is basically made of a bunch of um, different layers, different layers. On the innermost, you have the um, gastric fold, your air mucosal interface, your muscularis mucosa. With the probe that you generally use is the abdominal probe. Usually what you are seeing is that thick hyperechoic uh, muscularis propriae. Um, but you can maybe sometimes see these other as well. But don't be too uh, concerned if you're not picking up individual layers. So kind of, again, we're going to go into the actual individual um, images and but ways to look at it is basically what shape is your antrum, how thick is your wall, and then kind of what does your content look like on the inside. Is it nothing? Is it heterogene uh, heterogeneous? Do you see speckles and spots? Or is it just kind of a big black blob? And I think through this, we're just going to kind of just go through this table and just show um, just examples here. So just to kind of give you a just overall sonoanatomy overview here. 
Um, so again, kind of we're in that epigastric view. We see skin, rectus abdominis, shoot through the liver, and right there is our gastric antrum. And posterior, again, po- um, is your pancreas. You'll sometimes see, ideal, you'll see um, another artery that's the SMA coming off of the aorta, coming off the, uh, coming off the plexus. But then it's trying important to catch this aorta all the way deep here. And again, that gives you your, um, just shows you that you're catching your antrum at the right level. So what does an empty stomach look like? So for starting with an empty stomach, you'll see this kind of big black kind of ring and then almost this um, concentric inner fold here. You'll hear this called kind of a bullseye sign. Um, and literally what you're seeing is the stomach is so collapsed that the walls are literally just folding in on themselves. And again, here's your aorta back here, liver here. And then here, it seems that we can't really pick up. This might be SMA here. Not too um, sure here. But again, if you see your liver and your aorta, then you know you're catching your stomach kind of at that right level. And let's see here. I have a video. Let's see if it plays. If not, no worries, some technical difficulties here. Okay, so the video it doesn't like was working, um, but just one thing I want you to note is that everything is great, theoretical, easy peasy on still imaging, but there's a lot of kind of motion artifact and you really got to keep your probe um, there for a few seconds as, you know, belly breathing, belly moves up and down, diaphragm moves things in and out. Um, so while clean still images look nice and pretty, it can be a lot more nuanced on a moving image. And therefore, also, I recommend, you know, just kind of save a clip and then go back and try and find a nice still image um, to kind of analyze instead of, and then as you get more proficient, you'll be able to kind of do your analysis in real time. But I think starting out, it's easy to, or a lot easier to just kind of focus on getting images, save your clips, and then reviewing those clips um, kind of when you can focus better. So early stage solids are solids come in basically two flavors. You ingest a solid and the first, you know, the first stage, that early stage, when it still hits the stomach, there's a lot of mixing going on. Air, water, just everything, fluid or solid, everything's just kind of mushed together and just um, nothing is separated. And that will give you just this really hazy picture. Um, this will be sometimes called like a, a, gra- a stained glass um or frosted glass picture appearance. And then sometimes what you might see is just such a, um, such a high amount of solids and such density that you, you just basically can't see through it. You see this kind of ring down artifact here at your antrum and you see black behind it. And it's just, there's so much solid, again, ring down artifact that you just can't see past it. Um, and you would be inclined here almost sometimes to say, what am I looking at? Do I see antrum? Is this stomach at all? And I think that's where, again, your secondary landmarks, your liver, your aorta, if you can see your SMA, if you can see a pancreas, those will clue you in to say, listen, I'm not seeing antrum because it's so full or this little speck here is the antrum casting just a shadow down everything else. So again, solids early stage, while they might be some of the most obvious signs, they might be some of the most difficult to kind of um, interpret at the same time there. Um, So then, like I said, you ingest a solid, there's a lot of kind of mixing around, everything's going down, and then things just kind of start to settle out. Um, Little bits of solid just kind of start to settle out, and then the fluid and the air just kind of starts to collect and form little pockets. And this here, you'll start to get kind of a starry gazed almost appearance, and that's kind of what you'll see in the literature sometimes that is referred to, Um, kind of that starry night pattern. Um... But what you'll notice here, it's kind of on a light backdrop versus what I'm going to show you here is that air bubbles, if it's clear fluid, is kind of on a black backdrop. Um, So you guys know by now it's, you know, solids kind of appear more hyperechoic, whereas fluid is more hypo, if not anechoic. 
So as I touched on, um, here's now what kind of clear fluids will look like. And as you can imagine, just clear fluids, just kind of a hypoechoic, just nice round black circle. What you'll sometimes see is kind of flickers of air kind of coming in and out. That's just air bubbles, but that's still a clear fluid. Um, so, you know, it might look similar to that late state solid. But again, here on that late state solid, you'll see your backdrop is almost kind of entirely white, if not gray. Whereas here, your backdrop is, you know, you have a few speckles really in just a uh, just a sea of black. So. We've got our images. We think we know what we're looking at. What do we kind of do with it? Is this a full stomach? Is it not? So kind of it works in generally kind of a two-step fashion here. First is kind of a just general qualitative examination. Again, you're doing this both supine and lateral. So what do we look at? Basically, what does my probe look at or what did my probe look like uh, versus those three stock images? Are we empty? Do we have clear fluid? Do we have solid? For the extremes, it's pretty cut and dry. That's the relative end of the analysis right there. If you see folds, that kind of bullseye sign, you're negative, you're, um, you're an empty stomach, low aspiration risk. If you see solids, those kind of speckled against that gray backdrop, um, or just that kind of frosted glass appearance, then you know you have solids, you're a full stomach, high aspiration risk. But what about that clear fluid? That kind of falls in a sort of gray zone. Um, and that's where we now do a sort of secondary analysis. Now we do a quantitative examination to actually quantify that um, gastric volume. So what you do is you are able, you, you, through your, um, through your images, you take your caliper tool and you r draw a ring around the antrum, try and include the folds as well, or the gastric antrum wall as well, not just the lumen itself. Um, and this will give you a CSA, just that it's a, a cross surf, sorry, a curved section area. And you plug it into this equation here. This is a well validated equation um, that has two variables here, as you can see, that CSA that you're calculating, and then the age of the patient. And this will give you a gastric volume. And basically, you divide it by their weight. And you compare it to the uh, baseline gastric secretions, which is uh, about one and a half cc's per kilo. So you look at your measured gastric volume through this equation here, and you see, am I more than one and a half cc's per kilo? Now that's more than gastric baseline gastric secretions, so that's positive for a full stomach, high aspiration risk, or am I less than gastric baseline secretions? Am I less than that one and a half cc's per kilo? Am I a negative, uh, considered a negative stomach or low aspiration risk? One thing to note though about getting the CSA value, um, ideally what you would do is you would take the mean of three values and then that makes it uh, better instead of it being just kind of totally biased or totally dependent on one value there. One thing I want to note here is this, you see this one and a half cc's per kilo as that baseline. I just want to go back to what I showed you about that study here, um, where they took that gastric volume um, ultrasound and they did a volume there. And you'll notice that their cutoff here is about 111 cc's. For a 75 kilo person, that's actually about one and a half cc's per kilo. So I think that predictor there that they showed you in the literature is well validated at that one and a half cc's per kilo um, kind of baseline there. <clears throat> so another way you can uh, kind of grade your antrum is through this kind of three grading uh, or three tiered system, this kind of qualitative analysis. Um, and it's kind of quick and dirty. So you look at um, fluid, do you see it ideally? So we'll go grade zero. So you see it empty, both supine, you turn them on their side, still empty. That's corresponds with the, that's called a grade zero antrum. And that corresponds with a low aspiration risk. Ideal or uh, alternatively, grade one is if you see it, it looks empty in the supine, but now you flip them over to the right lateral decubitus and you can see some clear fluid. Now that correspond, generally corresponds with that less than 1.5 cc's per kilo mark and co generally corresponds with a low aspiration risk. Um, or on the uh, farthest end, you see clear fluid in both positions. And in that case, that usually corresponds with a high 
or a full stomach or that high um, aspiration risk greater than 1.5 cc's per kilo. So this is just kind of a quick and dirty. If you see it, you know, in certain positions, you can make estimations. But again, I would say in general, if you have the time to quantitatively measure your fluid content, always do that. Um, but this kind of gives you an alternative qualitative fluid analysis. So we mentioned kind of, you know, now we have this information. Now, what do we do with it? We, you know, we think we know this patient is a full stomach, empty stomach. Um, what do we do with this? So we mentioned um, kind of what the point is, at least in the anesthesia world of gastric ultrasound, and that's kind of aspiration risk mitigations. So aspiration risk um, can, or your, your gastric ultrasound can kind of point you towards what aspiration precautions do you take? I know in the emergency um, medicine world, I feel like you guys are, you do a lot of rap, uh, rapid sequence ultras, or sorry, rapid sequence inductions anyway, um, kind of maximizing those aspiration precautions, but maybe you see clear fluid. Maybe this is something that you can drop an NG tube now versus is the solid fluid or solid contents that um, is definitely not getting brought up after an NG tube. In the anesthesia world, we like um, sometimes we will do an endotracheal tube versus an LMA, um, or we will kind of tailor our um, our, our case, uh, whether or not canceled or, or, or delay based on that. Um, but for you guys, I think kind of quantitate, quantitatively knowing what you're seeing in the stomach and how much you're seeing, um, you guys will be able to, to maybe do with that different things than, than I would up in the OR here. Um, so just a few populations that I wanted to just touch over and just how the world of gastric focus applies to them. So generally up until now, I had been talking about just your general adult, um, non-crazy obese BMI under 40. So we're going to look at a three basic uh special populations now, and I'm just going to kind of talk about how gastric pocus applies to them. So in the pediatric population, it's a very well validated, it's still a well validated tool. Solids still look like solids, fluids still look like fluids, um, empty stomach still looks like empty stomach, but your equation calculation is going to be different. Um, your factors are still the same. You're still measuring that uh, cross-sectional area and you're still um, factoring it for an age, but um, your, your, your volume calculation is different. So that's one thing to note. Also, one thing to note is that for pediatrics under 18, it's validated only in your, if you get less than one and a half cc's per kilo. So if you do this quantitative analysis and you're getting, and it's showing you that you have a negative, um, or an empty stomach, you can pretty well rest your head on that. But if you see, if, you're, if your number is giving you greater than that 1.5 cc's per kilo mark, then um, they, it, it unfortunately isn't as well validated and it still might be sensitive or it still, may be, um, still might be empty. With regards to that gastric volume equation I had mentioned earlier as well, um, it's very well validated into the BMI less than 40 category, but then after that, it starts to diverge. So with your vastly morbidly obese, um, your gastric volumes are going to be uh, not as reliable. But again, if you still see that bullseye appearance in an even morbidly obese population, that still suggests an empty stomach. And obviously with the um, morbidly obese, it's a much more technically challenging uh, study. But and with a much deeper antrum, but it is definitely still feasible. Likewise, also with the pediatric population, one thing to note is that for these people, just using a linear probe with these um, with these kids is generally sufficient. But anyone else over eighteen, you're usually just going straight to your uh, to your curve curve probe on a abdominal default. And then also the pregnant population. Um, so unfortunately, it's not a great validated tool with regards to pregnant patients. Um, it seems that if they are still grade zero, like, you know, negative or, or an empty stomach will still look like an empty stomach in, patient, in pregnant populations. But the grading and that kind of quantification of those gastric volumes is still um, greatly debated. And then, so, you know, I talked about all these great things about gastric pocus, but, you know, kind of what are some limitations? When, when do you have to kind of consider not using gastric pocus. Basically, it's anything that's going to distort your gastrointestinal anatomy. So any patients with history of gastric resections, bypasses, gastric tumors, large hiatal hernias, any previous fundoplications, and again, anything that's going to 
alter your your gastric anatomy to the point where your calculations are going to kind of now be skewed. Um, and then again, like I said, a lot of this research and those quantification values come from that right lateral decubitus position. Um, and that's really ideally needed to fully access your gastric contents, which in a critically um, critically ill or very, very acute um, clinical scenario might not always be feasible. But again, I just want to give you, just introduce you guys to this new tool. Um, I think it's a very nice tool to kind of, again, quick and dirty, just kind of bedside rapid assessment of gastric contents and then towards the ultimate, um, objective of minimizing aspiration and, uh, yeah, exactly that minimizing aspiration and how to do airway management as safely as possible. So with that said, um, I just want to actually just shout out a very nice resource called gastricultrasound.org. Um, this is where most of my uh, kind of example images were coming from. Um, and it really is just a fantastic resource, really just can kind of show you everything you need to do um, and has tons of examples, both uh, still images and movie clips to kind of show you what different stomachs look like in different populations in different scenarios. So um, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys, and uh, happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much. That was a that was a very good um, summary of gastric ultrasound and just kind of how you do it, why you do it, some of the numbers. I know one of the the things that I've struggled with as I've tried to dig into this a little bit is just okay, fine, we can you know find the structures and maybe put some calipers on it, but what do these numbers mean? And do I have to memorize this whole nomogram? And so I think boiling it down to that quantitative and then that qualitative uh, way of looking at it was, was super duper helpful just to kind of give us the kind of all the details, but then a quick and dirty, like, how do I get it done um, at the bedside? So thank you for that. That was, that was very helpful. Um, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll see. Does anyone else have questions real quick before I jump in? Let me check the chat here. Nothing in the chat. Anyone have questions real quick before we, before I get to my questions? Hi, um, Dr. Leeds here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't necessarily have uh, questions. I, I thought that, you know, when I, when I first, when Dr. Schwartz first, uh, stated that he wanted to do this for his Grand Rounds product. I was, I was incredibly happy, and I I know it turned out so well for us. And I know that some, some, you know, some things to add, not necessarily questions. Um, uh, just some of the technical stuff that I've seen with everyone. So gastric ultrasound is not entirely new. It's been around for you know, there's been studies coming up for like a, for about a decade already about it. Um, with the new explosion of, of GLP agonists and gastric motility slowing agents, we've seen a lot more of our patients come in with, you know, evidence of, of regurgitation and full stomachs. And, and we kind of had to, uh, the ASA put out a, a pretty urgent statement about how to handle these type of patients. Um, you guys in the ED don't necessarily have the luxury of canceling a case when you do see a full stomach uh, with gastric ultrasound or delaying intubation, because your intubations are, are you know, emergent uh, intubations for a reason. So I would, I would guess that that's would be, be a reason why uh, certain aspiration rates would be higher in the ED um, than anesthesia. Um, uh, but I want to talk about kind of um, image acquisition a little bit. Um, when they originally did the studies, the having the the aorta, the SMA, uh, the gastric antrum, and, and the liver as as uh, actually this picture uh, right here on the screen is these were the standard uh, images that they got um, to help standardize the measurements that were taken and to reduce uh, provider um, subjectivity. Um, the the fluid volume status measurements that they got were actually very, very accurate uh, and reproducible. Um, they tested people drinking a certain uh, amount of fluid and and with different providers that took different measurements actually got very, very similar um, readings for that. Um, for those measurements actually taken, uh, we typically hold the, the probe on. We want to visualize uh, full cycles of peristalsis, um, and you could see that with with the evidence of of the um, the muscular layer of the stomach uh, kind of squeezing. 
when you take the measurements, take it at, at the points where the uh, peristalsis is the least, the least amount of squeeze so that you have the, the largest amount of, of surface area uh, within that. Um, so that, that's, uh, I know Dr. Schwartz has said, take the, the average of, of those three. Just make sure that, you know, you kind of visualize the peristalsis as at its, at its lowest point where, where you can get the, the highest uh, cross-sectional area. Um, also, um, you'll see, with, especially with, you know, kind of these, these uh, full stomachs, um, the colon can often be confused for the stomach. So you'll see that a little bit more uh, caught ad. So just, just make sure you, what you're really looking for is that thick muscular uh, layer, that kind of hypoechoic ring around the stomach to kind of minimize that as well. And one last point. Uh, that I would like to just add would be, um, so why do we take a uh, even image in the supine position if we're just going to turn to right lateral decubitus? And what does that show us? Well, if they have a full stomach in the supine position, that is definitely a full stomach. However, if you don't see anything or, or you, you, you're unsure, um, you can't rule out an empty stomach just because you, you see an empty stomach in the supine position. So it, it takes very little time to put place the probe on in supine. If you see that full stomach, that is definitely full stomach. However, if, if you know if you then don't see that full stomach, turn them to right lateral, and then and then get that same standardized image. Um, and you'll see that just due to gravity alone, uh, oftentimes that will be uh, actually revealing to be a full stomach. And one last uh, side note. Um, just kind of just for future thought, the 1.5 ml per kilogram is a very, uh, they're, they're finding out it's actually a very conservative uh, approach to what a full stomach is. So we're, we're going to go by 1.5 until they tell us otherwise, but they're kind of finding now that 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 residual volume is uh, kind of upwards of that. So, but again, uh, Dr. Schwartz had an uh, amazing presentation. I just wanted to add those. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. That was helpful just to have kind of that additional feedback, um, you know, about the about the studies. And I, you you touched on a little bit, you know, like I was writing down some questions during the the presentation, um, and then as I was writing them down, Dr. Schwartz was answering them. <laughs> and then as I, I was looking back over them, Dr. Leeds, you answered some more of them, or at least in partial, you know, partially kind of hit on them. So, but maybe I'll clarify just a few more of these questions. Um, you mentioned that if it's empty on the supine, you have to turn to right lower right lateral decubitus. And I guess the original question is, is there a size difference between the two? And it sounds like the answer is probably yes. There is a size difference between the supine and the right lateral decubitus, especially when you're trying to call it completely negative. Um, probably, I guess the corollary that I can think of is like when we do a FAST exam, like mm -hmm. we don't call a FAST negative until we've seen all the windows is negative. And if one of them is not negative or is not seen, we just call it indeterminate. And so mm -hmm. like the similar logic, at least, like you have to have these two views as empty to say empty, otherwise it's indeterminate or, you know, you can't say for sure. So sounds like that's probably the answer to that question of, is there a size difference between um, the supine and the right lateral decubitus, right? Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if I would describe it necessarily as, or maybe I'm just misunderstanding it as a size difference, but it's just a sensitivity difference for sure and a dependency difference. So like I mentioned, kind of that stomach is funnel shaped. And when you're supine, that stomach is, or that funnel is kind of running more laterally. Mm -hmm. But then when you go on your, when you flip them onto the right side, that funnel is much more vertically or much more vertically oriented. So yes, in that sense, it, it might now get bigger or appear to get bigger um, because now literally the stomach is now full with the contents. Um, so in that sense, it may be a size difference, but again, just, yeah, that it's a much more sensitive view than that supine. So again, always erring on the side of safety, like Dr. Leeds mentioned, again, you see full stomach supine, you know, it's going to be there in, a, in the, in the right lateral. But again, you can't rule out if you see negative or empty in, in supine, you, you can't just stop it there. You have to now, uh, per pursue that in the right lateral. Yeah. I mean, that's an important physics property of ultrasound in everywhere, right? Gravity pulls fluids to the least dependent space. And so mm -hmm. we're just creating a space of least dependency. Um, when we do that rolling from exactly from yep. supine to right, right lateral to cubit. So that makes perfect sense. Um, the other question, um, I have a couple more, um, you mentioned the 1.5 milliliters per kilogram um, 
as your cutoff for volume. Now, Mike mentioned that that it's maybe a little bit of conservative value, but we're going to go with it, right? That's what we're using. Mm -hmm. um, let's say 1.5 milliliters per kilogram uh, as the volume that we can say we're shooting to be underneath. Is that um, going to be ideal body weight or is it actual body weight? Because to me, it doesn't make a ton of sense to say, okay, you take the same person, same height person, um, and you know one of them is 150 pounds, the other one's 250 pounds. All of a sudden, one person gets a huge allowance for or stomach size, but there's no general morphologic difference of the frame. Um, it's just the the adipose tissue around it. So, is it ideal or actual body weight? Um, so that's a great question that I unfortunately I actually don't have the answer for. I would imagine it's ideal body weight in the literature, though I actually don't know if I saw really anything clearly distinguished. But I would imagine ideal would be the most, again, would be the safest value to kind of use, kind of like ventilating someone at four to six cc's per kilo. It's ideal body weight. Again, these kind of ways we imagine anatomy sizes or, you know, that the size of your lungs, the size of your stomach generally tends to be from ideal body weight, generally basically, you know, predictor of height um, more than weight then. So I, I believe Dr. Lee, you can correct me, but I believe it's ideal body weight. Um, but that would definitely be something to, to maybe verify on your own. I'm going to triple check, but I remember looking this up at one point and actually being surprised that it was real body weight. Um, but I will definitely, before I make that as my statement, um, clarify that and get back to you. But I, I was actually, I just remember being like a little bit shocked that it actually is, um, more than ideal or at least, uh, an adjusted body weight. Yeah, that's interesting. And it may just be something as simple as the methods were sloppy in the research studies, like the original studies where they just picked, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to pick weight and we're going to assess this thing. Um, and if future research parses out ideal versus actual, there may come out to be some, some difference. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I don't know this literature, so I'm just speculating, but, um, I know a lot of times when we have these parameters that we utilize, it's because some study did it that way. Um, and when you dig into why they did it that way, so I don't know, I just did it that way. So <laughs> It may just be yeah. that that's an area for a, a budding young researcher to kind of to, to get, dig into further to, to clarify the physiology. So um, cool. So the last question I have, um, you know, I think one of the and you hit on this nicely, I, I think is you were very insightful to say, OK, here's the anesthesia side of the world. But we're speaking to at least, you know, in the live version of this, right, a primarily emergency medicine based forum now. You know, online on the YouTube channel, we have, you know, people from all over the place with all sorts of specialties. And so, you know, undoubtedly, you know, there's people that, you know, you spoke to spoke their language, you know, um, in terms of elective cases. But for us, like, I don't have the choice to to postpone someone's crashing airway, right? They're dying. Um, hold on a minute. Don't yeah. die yet. Let me <laughs> <laughs> let me let your stomach empty here yeah. for a minute and then we'll get you intubated. Right. Um, so you know, we get around that by doing RSI, right? And this is kind of what you guys do too. Mm -hmm. Like if you have an emergent trauma airway, you're probably going to be more likely RSI them just, than just do like the, oh, let's push a little now and then kind of wait about five minutes, do a Sudoku. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anesthesia joke, right? Um, and then get them, you know, fully induced and mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? Yeah. You're, you're crashing them in. Um, so um, I guess speak to the, maybe the naysayer emergency medicine physician mm -hmm. saying like, look, man, there are priorities and their priorities, right? A, B, C, and we're talking about G for gastric and then U for ultrasound. Like, why should I do this in my RSI patient? Like, is this gonna affect maybe how I set up the RSI, maybe how I position the patient, head a bed up, you know, gonna, you know, it, it, can this be effective in terms of helping me manage my RSI patient in the emergency department versus kind of like a, a delayed induction? Um, yeah, so I think that's a very good question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you because I just, being in the anesthesia world. Um, so I know, you know, you guys are pinned into that point where, you know, you, you are RSI and you have to RSI, whether or not the stomach is full or empty is not going to make a huge difference to you guys at that point. I think with regards to kind of the nature of the fluid, whether it's clear, whether it's not, mm -hmm. whether it's amenable maybe for suction, nasal de uh, NG tube decompression versus it's just air um, or is a solid content. I think that maybe can kind of guide you towards a management. Maybe now there's a sort of pre-intervention you can use to maybe more um, to increase your safety before you kind of go ahead and secure that airway, before you go ahead and take away those airway reflexes. Mm -hmm. um, 
that would be kind of the most obvious in my mind. Um, but other than that, uh, nothing immediately is kind of coming to mind here. Sure. And, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years, um, you know, emergency medicine is, is, it, is it a unique field, right, for many, many reasons, um, largely because it's so brand new, right? And we steal a little bit of everything from a little bit of everyone, mm-hmm. right? And we have to be multilingual and be able to talk to everyone. Um, and, you know, there's always... In any situation, there's always gives and takes, right? There's there's a trade-off, like, hey, the most ideal way to do something is A, right? But given the circumstances, I don't have the luxury of being able to do A, so I'm going to do B, and uh, I'll have to give a little on, on A, right? Um, and to put that in more concrete terms, like in the airway world, like in the most ideal world, I would be gastric empty, and I would, um, you know have everything all prepped and ready to go. Um, kind of, I'd be in an OR, you know, <laughs> things I'd have an anesthesiology, you know, background, um, you know, but I don't have that. And so I just have to secure the rapidest, safest airway possible. Um, and so we tend to think about things um, in those terms, which means, you know, big nail, I have hammer must hit, you know. Uh, but what I've learned over the years as I've done more of this is, okay, yes, you know, there's a nail, I have a hammer, I must hit the nail with the hammer. But, maybe I have a couple hammers to hit it with, right? And I pick the right one, um, or is this the right way to hit it? Uh, and so there is a little bit of like, as emergency medicine as a specialty is growing and as, as I'm hopefully maturing as a clinician in emergency medicine, um, I'm learning more nuanced ways of doing things. And so I think what this highlights is, you know, yeah, there's those crashing airways where they just gotta be done. Like they need to be tubed yesterday, no time for anything. Let's, let's roll, let's get this in. We'll deal with whatever comes up literally um, in the process. And then there's those other airways. And I think the bulk of our airways are probably like, you know, it needs to be done in the next 10 minutes, but I have 10 minutes to prep as much as possible so that when the rubber hits the road and I finally push that paralytic and the deal's done and it's go time, like that go is going to go as good as possible, right? And so I think this may be an area where, you know, when there's concern, potentially we could throw in some ultrasound and say, okay, what are the, what are the conditions? I can't fix any of them, but what are the conditions that I can at least be anticipating as I'm getting into a very high risk situation? So no, I love it. I think this is a great, you know, thing that, you know, probably should be a little bit more ubiquitously utilized um, in the emergency department. And then I guess the other area where this would be helpful for us is when we do procedural sedation. And that's probably, the the more elective and potentially it gets depends how you slice it the potentially higher risk uh, situation maybe the patients come in healthier but you know that means the baseline is a lot better than someone mm-hmm. who's coming in crashing burning um, and so um, having a good understanding of you know yeah we look at the Allen Potty score and you know you know we make sure they have normal heart tones but really do the heart tones affect the sedation probably not but then you know their stomach probably does mm-hmm. and so having that assessment um, probably is not a bad idea. So, no. um, so that's great. I, I mean, I thought this was a super helpful conversation. Um, any other questions, uh, comments from my emergency medicine colleagues, uh, Dr. Leeds, do you have anything else you wanted to comment on or, or share? No, I think, uh, I think everything that I could add, that was, that was a great discussion. Um, I'm still looking into the, uh, ideal versus adjusted stuff. Um, but, uh, I, I don't know. I, I keep learning more and more every, every day. There's always going to be um, you know, uncertainty in uh, not being able to, you know, make the diagnosis of a full stomach and or clear and, you know, um, just, you know, abdominal tissue, um, other reasons why people might, you know, you, you can't get the window. So you need to use your, your clinical judgment. And I'm seeing reasons why I can't make that um, definitive uh, clinical judgment every, every day. So um, you guys, We'll see, you know, as, as more and more people are on the GLP agonist as, as it's becoming a thing, um, you, I think you should take a, you know, scan everybody's stomach um, and just to, just because you'll be able to see, they're like, I haven't eaten in since yesterday. And, and you know, it's 8 p.m. the night, the next night, and they look like they just ate two hours ago. So these transit times are, are so decreased, um, well, increased, um, but uh, it's, it's just such a uh, evolving field and, and we could all be on, on the forefront and make, you know, much better clinical decisions and, and use our, our, our reasoning to, to help patient safety. As, as Dr. Schwartz said, any aspiration event is 
um, very, very detrimental uh, to the patient. So anything we could do to, to minimize, to avoid, um, even just to know what we're getting into uh, really, really does help. Great. Well, thank you both for taking the time out of your busy days um, to, to come and talk to us about how we can improve our care in the emergency department. And then for all those who are watching us both live and on the YouTube channel, how we can improve the, the care of the patients that are, that are, um, you know, going to be coming in our doors. Right. And so one of the things I think is cool about this forum is just the ability that we can have here to impact the lives of countless people around the world, right. Through, um, through the, the teaching that we have here. So, um, thanks so much. Um, what you do really matters and I'm glad that you're here to, to talk to us about it. So with that said, we'll wrap it up here. Um, join us next time for our on grand rounds. We're actually going to take next week off. So by the time this actually drops on YouTube, I will have been and back for from the AIUM Ultracon 2024 conference in Austin, Texas. This is um, probably by far one of the best ultrasound related conferences that I go to. Um, I've gone there, I was talking to my one of my kids today, uh, I think like eight out of the last 10 years. Um, so it's a spectacular conference, looking forward to going, looking forward to getting back. But in light of the fact that um, I'll have just gotten back from the conference, we won't be having grand rounds next week. Um, but then we'll return the following week uh, with some more stuff. I know, I think the following week we have abnormal first trimester ultrasound. So we're going to get back to the OB stuff, uh, talk a little bit more about obstetric ultrasound sounds and we're lining up some really cool talks for the rest of the academic year so you'll definitely want to stay tuned um, if you're here in the live zoom link it's the same zoom link for the rest of the academic year for those of you who are joining us on the youtube channel um, keep coming back we'll keep dropping these videos hit that subscribe button uh, share it with your friends hit that notification bell so you can get these videos uh, presented up to you the moment we drop them uh, so you can get this information uh, we really appreciate all that and all the support that you guys have been given so with that said let's take let's wrap it up here we'll see you guys next time for for more Ultrasound Grand Rounds. Thanks, guys. Bye.